because they wanted to dramatize what life is like in Belarus. Nothing says dictatorship like arresting people for eating ice cream. <laughs> so they get this stuff up there. Right? And now the real world action is like, what do you mean? I love these. Of, of everything in the book, these are the people who, this is, this is my favorite bit of research. And they've done this several times. My favorite actually was, uh, it's, it's less photogenic, but, but uh, in a way philosophically more interesting. Let's all walk around October Square smiling at each other. Right? There's a dilemma for the cops, right? Because <laughs> The directive, arrest any citizen who seems unusually happy, is pretty much a caricature of the police. <laughs> these guys have taken this tool and they've pressed it into service for their own political needs. And we love these stories, right? This has been the theme of the kind of sustained and participatory tools we've had. Since Howard Rheingold documented the Philippine, the anti Estrada revolution, largely coordinated by SMS in the Philippines in the early part of this decade. And there's lots of these stories. The 40,000 kids who walk out of the LA Unified School District a couple of years ago to protest an anti immigration bill. Right? Um, HSBC, the bank, was brought to heel and forced to abide by a contract that had written with college students because of a Facebook protest. Just last week, right? There was a protest against the Canadian version of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, also organized on Facebook. We love these stories, they're great stories. I put a lot of them in the book, but there are a lot of them in the world. We all know them, but here's the thing. This didn't occur to me until after I'd finished the book and I was going around telling these stories. Most of these stories, most of the stories we have of real world collective action rely on stock energy. They're about coming together quickly and trying to get some external group to stop doing something, to capitulate in some way. The normal case for these stories is uh, are stories of a protest. Now, why is that? Why is there, for, the, for real world collective action, so much focus on stuff? It couldn't just be the second law of thermodynamics, right? It couldn't just be, it's easier to stop things than start. I don't think that holds up, and here's why. This is, this is something I came across just a couple of weeks ago. This is a page from someone participating in the Lego figurine modding community. Not to be confused with the ordinary Lego figurine community. So if you need instructions on taking an ordinary Lego figurine and turning it into, you can see down here in the lower right hand corner, Mr. Sick, right? You got the hookup, right? This, this community is where you want it. Right? Or this group, the homeschool buyers group. Right? Now, homeschooling is some, it, it, it are a group of people who almost by definition have tried to unplug from classic, classic collective action, right? classic provision of education as a public good, and said, no, we're going we're gonna to pull this into the home. And yet they banded together and formed essentially a back office for themselves. Group buying pools, trading lesson plans, textbook sales. Right? They've taken this kind of this kind of coordinated tool, and they've turned it to their advantage, even as the schools remain in the home. Or this example, right? The tax almanac would be. I don't even need to explain. Right? And the point here, from the Lego example to, to the tax example, is that the amount of starting and sustaining energy available on the web today is astonishing. Every place you turn, you will see people beginning things or building things that are meant to, to create value for all the participants and to last a long time. Right? It's not, in fact, a medium that's only good for protest. So now maybe collective action is harder. Right? Even if the internet is good at supporting starting and sustaining things, maybe collective action is just harder. And that's certainly the case. Right? It is harder because everyone stands or falls. That's the definition of collective. It's not like the Lukashenko government is going to collapse for some of those kids, right? It's either going to collapse or it's not going to collapse. And then everyone in the country will benefit or not in the same way. And so collective action requires a much higher commitment to the group and the group's shared goals than ordinary sharing and participation. But even then, we have examples of people coming together and doing that kind of work. Here is the canonical example farm raising, right? People coming together to build a giant building, often in a single day. And this is a classic example of collective action. It's not like 
60 people can build a barn in a day, so one person can build a barn in two months. You have to have a group to do this. And yet, this isn't a commercial transaction. Right? So why am I going to roll out of bed at the crack of dawn and spend my entire day in backbreaking labor to build a barn? Right? There's only two answers to that question. Either because I owe you a favor, or because I want you to owe me a favor. And barn raising happens in communities where the density of mutual favors is, is enough to act as a support for collective action. What barn raising relies on is the idea that not just a few people are to the fairness, but that the whole group will be held together this way. And that there's enough continuity. If I do you a favor now, you're going to be a, around a year from now to collect. Barn raisings happen in communities with density and continuity. They don't happen in large, fast-moving groups. And doesn't that sound like something the internet is really good at using? <coughs> so the gap between this kind of collective action and what we've got in our social tools uh, is in many ways an inability to rely on that density. I don't know what it's going to take to give us that, but I do have a hypothesis. And here it is. Uh, in 1980, Xerox delivered the most famous printer in the world to MIT. It was the 9700, it was the first laser printer, but that's not why it was the most famous printer in the world. It's the most famous printer in the world because they delivered it without the source code. There were no instructions for how to work the printer by the new owners. And they delivered it to Richard M. Stallman's lab. And Stallman saw that and he said, I see this future and it is ugly. And three years later, he founded the Free Software Foundation, 25 years ago today. And everything that we know is free software or open source relies on that single intuition. What makes free software work is a licensing structure. It, is, it, it takes copyright law and it uses it to increase the freedom of the people who were, uh, increase the freedom of the users, right? which is the opposite of the usual effect of the right? That licensing structure. That bit of jujitsu which says to the state, this is copyright law from your point of view, but we're actually got this different set of goals over here. That's what I think may be missing with collective action. So the question I've been asking myself is, what would licensing look like if you wanted to license a group to take collective action instead of just a shared intellectual? I don't know for sure, but I do know that there's a lot of experimental work going on. One interesting, one interesting example. The Virtual Companies Project. This was signed into law by the governor, governor of Vermont just last week. It's a project done by David Johnson down at New York Law School. And the goal of a virtual company is to remove all of the disadvantages of incorporation. Because incorporation is the way the state defers to groups. If you and a group of five friends walk into a bank and say, we all like each other, we all have the shared goals, we're all getting along well. Give us a bank account. You'd be laughed out of the room. Right? One of you can open a bank account and get some co signed. But if that person disappears, the whole thing is over. Go away, you and your friend. Incorporate. Come back, say, now we're a corporation. Give us a bank account. The bank says, sign here. Right? Incorporation, literally in my mind, is the way states recognize the work of groups. But the current corporate structures require things like paper filings, physical headquarters, hierarchical management structures, in order for the state to recognize. What David Johnson has convinced Vermont to do is to allow corporations to form without those strictures. Virtual filings, no physical headquarters, non-hierarchical management structures. You still get a named persistent entity, but you no longer have to work the way traditional companies do. It's another example. Community interest companies. This is an example in the UK. Uh, community interest companies are a way to try and take the bug out of for-profit companies uh, that want to also have social goals. There's a lot of talk about triple bottom line. But the bug in the system is that although many of the stakeholders may recognize those goals, the law does not. Right? If I buy Ben & Jerry's tomorrow, and I announce the next day that the next two flavors of ice cream are going to be petroleum and high fructose corn syrup, right? I'm the owner. I get to do that. What a community interest company does is it allows you to form a for-profit company and put inalienable 
social goals at the heart of the enemy. Goals that can't be overridden even by subsequent others. So again, it's an attempt to take incorporation law right, and to turn it into a tool that supports group action other than the kind that we usually associate with for-profit. Final example. Right, Meetup is launching this. This is now, this is now in beta. Um, Meetup Alliance. The idea of taking Meetup groups and associating them at a regional or national level. And also inviting them to the mix. Yahoo groups, Google groups, groups that form online journey. An attempt to take individual action, which we've seen individual and local action, which we've seen so much of, and raise, raise the geographic level at which it operates. You can imagine in an election year what these groups will be able to do right, in terms of advocating for lobbying for policy changes. What I think is coming, right, Mom's Towns, Mom's Towns is I think one of the ones that can readily turn political. The Atheist Alliance, another group that's previously been distributed, suddenly coming together and taking relatively, relatively focused action. When these groups come together, they may not just be able to lobby for outcomes they want, they may be able to produce outcomes they want. Imagine if Linus Torvalds, that the only way that Linus Torvalds could have gotten a good operating system was by lobbying Microsoft instead of inventing Linux. Right. Imagine if the only way Jimmy Wales could have gotten a high quality free encyclopedia was to have protests outside Encyclopedia Britannica's headquarters until they released it free. Right. We would not have gotten the value we have today. Those are examples of creating and sustaining value. What, what is, I think, possible is to take that creating and sustaining value and to bring it into the world of collective action. I can't tell you if virtual companies or if community interest companies or if meetup alliances is the right answer, but I can tell you they're asking the right question, which is how do we take that energy that we see everywhere for production and for sharing among groups and bring it into the real world. Uh, if we don't ask that question,